Welcome to Smart News Digital, July 21, 2018. So today we are going to see all these topics. So the first article is Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government defeat no confidence motion. So we all know that yesterday was the second day of the monsoon parliament session. So during that monsoon session, the opposition party has moved this uh, no confidence motion against the ruling government. So while voting the motion has secured like 126 votes in favor of the motion and 325 against the motion proves that there is still faith which is in the uh, government or the ruling party so we have to know one thing according to rule 198 198 of the rules of Lok Sabha as well as the conduct of the Lok Sabha the no confidence motion in the sense it is actually the no confidence motion means expressing the want of confidence on the council of ministers which means the ruling party have to show their majority in the Lok Sabha uh, which was actually expected by the opposition party that means the opposition party asks for the no confidence motion they want the ruling party to prove their majority in the floor of the house so we all know that in our Indian constitution, there is neither the confidence motion or nor the no confidence motion term is explicitly mentioned. But in article 75 of our Indian constitution, so see here, the council of ministers shall be collectively responsible to the house of the people who are the Lok Sabha members. So this is what explicitly mentioned in the constitution, which indirectly means that the majority of the Lok Sabha people must support the prime minister and his cabinet. So this is what this article 75 of the constitution implicitly represent, which is nothing but the no confidence motion. So why we need this no confidence motion in the sense to ensure the answerability and the accountability of the ruling government over the people. So to ensure that we want this no confidence motion to be implemented or executed in the parliament but so if we see this no confidence motion can only be moved by the Lok Sabha members not by any private members or not by uh, Rajya Sabha members and all it is only be moved by the Lok Sabha members and once the Lok Sabha member put or give the notice to the speaker once the speaker asks the house members and if minimum 50 members of the Lok Sabha members approved for the execution for this motion there is no confidence motion to get executed then uh, the parliament discussions will be going on and debate will be going on on how the government is actually functioning and after that discussion the motion will be put to vote. So in that voting process if uh, the majority vote is favour of this uh, no confidence motion then the government is obliged to resign else the government continue. So while calculating this majority how they actually doing is if certain number of members of the parliament are abstaining from voting or absent from voting then that number of members are removed from the calculation and only the remaining members are taken into account and in that remaining members the majority of uh, votes can be taken into account for the decision taken for this no confidence motion. So if we see the background or the history of the no confidence motion there were already lot of no confidence motion be moved by the various governments or during the various governments like for example the first ever no confidence motion was moved against Jawaharlal Nehru government uh, uh, by JP Kripalani after the Indochina war in 1963 similarly three no confidence motion was moved against Lal Bahadur Shastri 12 no confidence motion was moved against Indira Gandhi so these are all the examples where uh, already this no confidence motion was taking place in our government previously if we see the difference between the confidence motion and the no confidence motion so this no confidence motion is moved by the opposition party to prove the majority of the ruling party but in case if it is a confidence motion it is moved by the government itself to prove its majority to counter the opposition party so you have to know these two differences what is a confidence motion as well as the no confidence motion and there is one more thing which is the censure which is different from the no confidence motion so this censure can be moved against individual members or the group of ministers regarding their uh, dysfunction or any allegations towards them. So this censure motion can be moved against any individuals or the group of ministers and it is just to show the disapproval that they are not functioning in the expected way. So it doesn't require them to resign from the uh, post or from the parliament. But in case of this no confidence motion, it is only be moved against the entire cabinet. So it needs entire cabinet. If at all this no confidence motion was favored by majority then obviously the entire cabinet has to be resigned or obliged to resign. 
so one more extra thing you have to note here is this is an extra information if the majority party normally we have to know first what a whip is a whip is a, a person who is appointed by every political party to issue the direction to the members of those political party on what they should do during the process of the parliament so in this case if the majority party or the ruling party issues a whip to its party member to vote in favor of the government that means to vote against the no confidence motion then the members are obliged to vote or obliged to work as per the whip rule so this is what the anti defection law which means anti defection law in the sense if a person is voting against the whip which is given by the political party's head or if he is not accordance with those whip then he is coming under this anti defection law and he is uh, sent out of the political party this is what anti defection law means so to be under this anti so to be not under the ambit of this anti defection law every person is obliged to vote according to the whip's direction so in this case if the majority party or the ruling party is issue a whip to the part uh, to the persons of their political parties that you should uh, vote against the no confidence motion then they are obviously going to do that and it is impossible to remove the government by this no confidence motion so you should understand the link between this no confidence motion anti defection law whip etc so the second article is 100 crore rupees is needed to recalibrate the atms all over the country so this is what the second article so recently the rbi had announced that it will issue or it will soon going to issue a new 100 rupee note which is of lavender color you see in this picture right so uh, here the atm industry or the atm operation industry shows their major concern because to issue this 100 rupees note in india there are around 2.4 lakh atms all over the country so which means if you want to issue this new 100 rupee note all these uh, 2.4 lakh atms need to be recalibrated in the sense you have to adjust the machine to dispense the valid currency note whatever it is requested by the customers so the change in dimensions of these new 100 rupees note is also a major concern because these all these atm machines have this currency cassettes as well as the atm software so all these software and as well as this cassettes need to be recalibrated if you want to disseminate this new 100 rupees note so what is the news here is the major uh, information which is very important for prelims perspective is this note is having a motif of uh, rani ki va so which is a step wall located on the banks of saraswati river in gujarat's patan so what is this rani ki va in the sense it is a water storage structure which is situated on the banks of saraswati river in the town of patan in gujarat so this was first unearthed by the asi which is the archaeological survey of india and it was found in very pristine conditions which means it was in a very clean condition so it was built on the memorial of king bima and it was built by the queen udayamati so this king this bima king is a chalukya king chalukya dynasty king which is also known as solanki dynasty so it was built as a memorial for this bima king by his wife which, who is this queen udayamati so they belong to chalukya dynasty which is also known as solanki dynasty and also the second major important fact about this rani ki va is it is the cleanest iconic place in india Uh, and it was declared by indian sanitation conference in new delhi in 2016 so one more important cultural perspective of this rani ki va is it was built in the complex maru gurjara architectural style which is the ancient rajasthani architectural style and it has inverted temple form with seven levels of stairs as well as it contain more than 500 principal statues so the third article is fault lines in a landmark judgment so recently the supreme court justice ak goel wanted to frame some guidelines on how to deal with the persons who are accused falsely under this prevention of atrocities act 1989 if suppose a person is accused falsely under the misuse of this prevention of atrocities act then what should be the solution for that this is what so a perfect guideline or a framework is needed this is what recently told by this uh, supreme court justice ak goel so what he mentioned uh, as the major concern for this prevention of atrocities acts are these two are the major concerns according to him one is this prevention of atrocities act 
creating terror in the society and it is also uh, this act is acting as a charter for the exploitation or the oppression of the innocent people that means people are using this prevention of atrocities act against the innocent people also this uh, prevention of atrocities act is used as an instrument of blackmail or to wreak the personal vengeance so these are all the major concerns uh, which forced uh, mr justice ak goel to come to this conclusion which is also raising a lot of uh, speculations in the society so if we see this uh, prevention of atrocities act 1989 in this pic the major objective of this prevention of atrocities act is to deliver justice to the sc st communities uh, with the proactive efforts from the government as well as enable them to live in a society with high dignity as well as self esteem without any fear or violence against them or any suppression against those sc st or minority people so this is what the major aim of the prevention of atrocities act but what he mentioned here is yes these scst members are need to be protected or prevented but at the same time no innocent uh, people or any other innocent people shouldn't be getting affected by means of this misuse of this prevention of atrocities act so this is what he stated here so if we see the features of this atrocities act then this prevention of atrocities act is a act of the parliament of india it punishes the crimes against the people who are belonging to the sc st communities and it also gives some special protection and rights to the victims who are getting affected by the suppression or violence against those sc st communities so it also under this prevention of atrocities act there they also plan to set up the courts or they actually can enable to set up the courts for the faster completion of the cases so to speed up the process uh, in order to get the justice for these uh, Uh, scst people they set up the courts also under this prevention of justice act and if you see in our constitution there are majorly four articles one is the article 17 which explicitly wants to abolish the untouchability and article 46 which promote the educational as well as the economic interest of these scst people and mainly these two one is the article 338 and another one is the article 338a so 338 is for national commission for scs and 338a is for national commissions for sts so these are all to ensure the rights and the dignity of those scst people apart from this national commission for scs and sts we are also now what is the twist here is the government is trying to establish something which is called national commission for backward classes so this is by means of 123rd amendment which is under the article 338b so 338 38a 38b now under 338 the government seeks to create this backward class commission so what the concern here is why the government is replicating or repeating the same procedure of establishing these kind of commissions for this minority people because already there exist some scst commissions which are dead which means they are not at all effective why the government is now trying to uh, implement something new for the backward classes this is what the article suggests so what we needed here is balancing the rights of the innocent people who are undergoing this arbitrary arrest as well as the interest or the dignity of the scst people need to be taken into account and also the social and the economic upliftment of these scst people by integrating them into the society by means of giving them adequate opportunities in case of education or employment so all these things if we provide then it must be the a uh, better solution for the efficient functioning of the governments these kind of policies so the next article is cryptocurrencies will boost illegal transactions so this is what told or said by the reserve bank of india to the supreme court so recently this rbi told to supreme court that dealing in cryptocurrency will encourage illegal transactions all over the country so first we have to know what is this cryptocurrency means so cryptocurrency is a virtual currency or a digital currency or an alternative currency for the normal fiat currencies these cryptocurrencies are used as a medium of exchange to transfer the money or to transfer or to have any kind of financial transactions so these cryptocurrencies use cryptography method 
to secure the financial transactions. So this cryptography method is used to secure the financial transactions. That is why this transaction is called cryptocurrencies and the cryptocurrencies are the virtual currencies or digital currencies. So they are stateless digital currencies and encryption techniques are used for trading. So they all are in digital and they are immune from the government interference in the sense it is not regulated by any body or organization. So this cryptocurrency is not under RBI, not under government. So it is not under any one's control. Uh, so this makes it a very vulnerable platform to encourage or to increase these kind of illegal transactions. So this cryptocurrency works on blockchain technology, which means nothing but a list of records. So it contains the person name and how much he actually and how much amount he is having now in his account or something so it is a ledger kind of a thing so it contains the list of all the members and their associated money details this blockchain is a, a public ledger which contains all the financial transactions information and once entered or once any data is updated into this ledger it cannot be deleted so this in early 2018 RBA actually banned the use or the sale and purchase of these cryptocurrencies in our country which means the, uh, the RBA actually announced that there is no legal tender for this cryptocurrencies. No legal tender in the sense it is not stating that it is illegal which means it is not used as a medium of exchange for the financial transaction. That is what it means this no legal tender. So normally we are using this rupee notes right. They are fiat currencies and they are legal tender. But these cryptocurrencies are not legal tender. So this is the difference between the cryptocurrencies as well as our normal fiat currencies. So the best example for the cryptocurrency is Bitcoin. So this Bitcoin is the world's first decentralized virtual currency which was released in 2008. Like this Bitcoin we are also having Litecoin, BBQ coin. So all these are the examples of the cryptocurrency. Similarly we have 700 plus cryptocurrencies existing all over the uh, world. So this blockchain we see right the blockchain is a distributed ledger system which contains all the financial transactions. So now our government and the RBA is trying to shift the focus of utility of this blockchain technology in our day to day activities. For example, ICIC Bank and Yes Bank are all using this blockchain technology in their uh, financial transactions. So these are like uh, storing the history of the transaction so we can easily trace back uh, and find whatever happened in the past. So now recently Indian banks are also been experimenting payments fund transfer infrastructure, digital identity management of the customers as well as the post trade settlement. All these things are digitized by means of using this blockchain technology. So digitizing land records is also can be done by means of using this blockchain technology in order to store all the history of the transactions whatever happened and we can trace back and uh, get the information of the financial transactions. So the conclusion here is it is not like this cryptocurrencies or the bitcoins or illegal just now the government is not giving the legal tender to these cryptocurrencies that is what the existing scenario so what it should do in the future is the government can give some ads or uh, wide publicity for the people to inform them or to educate them about the illegality which is in illegality which is involving in this uh, sale or purchase of these cryptocurrencies and make the people to shift their focus to uh, focus on the positive side of the cryptocurrencies for their transaction purposes. So the next article is Prime Minister Narendra Modi to visit three African nations. So what is the news is India will sign a defense framework agreement with Rwanda the next week. So why with Rwanda means Rwanda is the gateway for our country to Africa and as well as to enhance the bilateral ties between the India and South Africa. And also the Prime Minister Narendra Modi is planning to attend the BRICS summit which was going to be held in South Africa because South Africa is a strategic partner to India as it was held in January 2017. Already India and South Africa had agreements on dairy cooperation, leather exports, agriculture as well as the cultural ties. So it is uh, expected in the future that we have to sign a number of agreements and discuss further lines of credit which was provided by India to those South African countries. So these three African nations in the sense Rwanda, Uganda and South Africa. So already from our part, from India's part, $141 million for electricity projects and $64 million for agricultural ventures are provided 
uh, to the South African countries. So now they are actually planning to give 200 cows to a model village in Drivaro and also Prime Minister Narendra Modi is planning to visit Genocide Memorial Centre in Kigali which is the place where the Hutu Tutsi conflict was taken place. So what this Hutu Tutsi conflict in the sense it is an ethnic violence which was happened in Rwanda. So it is the slaughter of nearly 80,000 to 2 lakh Hutu people by Hutu militias by this Tutsi army in Burundi and as a revenge again some 2 lakh people to 3 lakh people of this Tutsi community was again slaughtered by this Hutu people. So this is a, a revenge scenario you understand right. So this is what this Hutu Tutsi conflict which result to the mass killing or mass genocide of lot of peoples. So now Prime Minister Narendra Modi is planning to visit that genocide memorial center in Kigali. So the next article is Supreme Court Collegium stands firm on the Justice Joseph which means the Supreme Court Collegium recently re-recommend to appoint Uttaragan High Court Chief Justice K. M. Joseph, Madras High Court Justice Indra Banerjee and Oriza High Court Chief Justice Vineet Saran into the Supreme Court. So what the major objection which is raised by the government is Justice Joseph who is the Uttaragan High Court Chief Justice now who is supposed to be appointed in the Supreme Court. So recently Union Law Minister Ravi Shankar Prasad raised a concern that Justice Joseph was too junior to be appointed into the Supreme Court. So this is a concern from the government's perspective. So the Supreme Court Collegium replied that actually we are duly considering the notice which was given by Ravi Shankar Prasad and after that we came to the conclusion that there was no adverse thing about Justice Joseph suitability to that position in the Supreme Court and we are uh, going to stand firm in this decision. So this is what the Supreme Court Collegium recently states. So the next article is India to host US for 2 plus 2 talk. So 2 plus 2 talk in the sense the defense minister and the external affairs ministers of the two countries will sit together to discuss the bilateral, regional as well as the global issues which is affecting their both the countries and they are coming to some kind of conclusions from the meeting. So India is going to conduct this 2 plus 2 talk on September 6 in New Delhi. So this is the recent news. So why this 2 plus 2 meeting between India and US in the sense it is to strengthen the strategic and security ties between India and US because we know that India is the major defense partner to the US and it is also planned to jointly address the challenges in the Indo-Pacific region and beyond. So this, these are all the purposes why India is now planning to host this 2 plus 2 talks. The next article is GST council may mull natural gas today in the sense they are the GST council is planning to include the natural gas in the GST regime. So the GST council is actually planning to do four major things. One is to include this natural gas in the GST regime. The second one is regionalization of tax rates including the sanitary parts as well as the handicraft items and the third one is simplifying of the returns filing procedure by the manufacturers or whoever filing for this GST so to make the process very simple that is also one of the purpose which the GST council is supposed or aimed at and the fourth one is to focus on additional tax base expansion measures which means to include more people in the taxpayers regime. So these are all the things that the GST council discussed recently. So why? Uh, I mean if we see the GST regime there are a lot of goods and services which are under GST and there are a lot of goods and services which are exempted from the GST. For example kerosene, naphtha as well as the LPG all are under GST and uh, this uh, natural gas, crude oil, diesel, petrol, aviation fuel these are all exempted from the GST. But even in case if you take that natural gas, that natural gas is mainly the industrial product it is used mainly by the industries it is not a consumer product it is mainly the industry products so if we include this natural gas into the GST regime it will obviously lead to the successful implementation of the input tax regime and the manufacturers or the industrialists may get benefited by means of this inclusion of uh, natural gas into the GST regime. If at all this natural gas is still excluded from the GST or it is not included into the GST then what will be the concerns in the sense the VAT or the value added tax paid on the procurement of this natural gas is not available as the credit to the manufacturers back which means they are giving some tax 
uh, for the procurement of the natural gas the industrialists are paying some tax but they are not getting after the process or once the process get over so this shoots up the price of the natural gas procurement and it is also obviously led to the increase in the cost of the natural gas which is availed by the industries so majorly that feki and the cii or the pressure groups or the industrial pressure groups who actually wanted to make this natural gas uh, into the gst regime so if it is not included then obviously the medium and the small industries are going to be economically unviable as well as uncompetitive so it reduces the competition because now the domestic manufacturing becomes more costly because of this natural gas procurement as it tends to be more costly and also the end users who actually want this natural gas now go for exploring the importing of the natural gas from other countries rather than procuring from the domestic market so this is also a major concern because it obviously reduces the competition in the domestic market and uh, how they justify this inclusion of this natural gas into the gst regime is the coal is under the 5% gst regime so even the polluting coal is under the 5% gst regime why the environment friendly natural gas is not yet included in the gst regime this is what the question which is raised by all the industrial activists and also if at all this natural gas is including into this gst regime it obviously cut down the losses which is procured by the industries as well as it will benefit the ongcs and all the industries whoever needing or whoever procured this natural gas